Okay, Kim, I think we're ready to go. Okay, and you're recording. Okay. Yes, I am. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> tuning in, right, uh, to Zoom on Nature with Coffee and Kim. Hope you all have your coffee. Got mine this morning. Which will be good because I started coughing last time. Uh, today, we're doing the third in the uh, Clayhead Trail series. And uh, if you've been on any of these already, um, you'll know that I've been taking the Clayhead Trail sort of off the beaten path, like not the main cliff walk, uh, which is uh, what most people go on. So you get a sense of what the trail system in the, uh, in the Clayhead area, some people call it the maze. I try not to, uh, but um, just to help orient you in case that's what you know it is. Um, and I will say before I get started that last time I, I announced that for the last few of these, I have hidden an orb in some of the photographs as we've gone uh, through. And I will say they're very difficult to see because they're transparent. But in this particular presentation, there are at least four hidden throughout. Now, I think one of the worst things about the orbs is that people spend too much time looking for them. So I hope that I haven't now just totally distracted you. <laughs> All right. So with that, we'll get going. Uh, today, we're going to be in the north part of the Clayhead Trail system. We've done uh, both sections of the middle uh, previously. The white line is a rough line of the Clayhead Trail land. Um, in the solid white, it's land that was um, uh, either given and or a combination of outright gifts and easements uh, from the Lapham family to the Nature Conservancy. The dotted line represents the DEM land um, and it's dotted because I don't exactly know where the boundaries are, but it's roughly right. As I said last time, do not use this particular map for wayfinding because I may have missed a jog here or there. And at the very top, we're going to, this is going to be another one of our loop uh, trails. We're starting at Corn Neck Road and we're going to end at Corn Neck Road. Uh, and the first part, we're going to start here, but because it's a loop, you could actually start wherever you want it. Well, you could start at either spot. Uh, the dotted white line that takes off from this spot represents uh, an easement over the road that um, we have that goes up until you actually enter the Clayhead uh, trail system. So that's just an overview. So when you see that the first part of this covers a lot of road area, uh, you won't be uh, too put off by that. Okay, so here's our path today. Again, the numbers uh, correspond to some of the slide play, location slides in the presentation. So we're to, for my purposes, I parked here at the little bump out on Corn Neck Road before you actually get to Settlers Rock. Uh, but you can actually park all along this edge. There's a lot of edge and you could, you know, cause you're gonna do a loop, you're gonna cover that part of the road anyway. Um, right about, yeah, let's see if I get my spots right. Right about here is a, another piece of property known as the Atwood. Oh, there we go, sorry, wrong place. Right about here's the Atwood Hill. So there's quite a bit of parking there. So depending on where you wanted your car to be when you came out at this spot, um, you could choose your spot. And you'll see that some of my best flower botanizing was actually along the paved road. So with that, uh, we'll get started. I've parked and I'm starting I'm actually starting at 15 <laughs> with some of the things that you see along uh, the edge of the road, between the edge of the road and uh, Sockham Pond. And I've started with these because they were right there near where I parked. And we spoke last week about the swamp rose mallows, which you're starting to be able to see all over the island around the edges of various ponds. And once you move, slow down to a walker's pace, you'll be surprised how many of these you see around the island. None of them as beautiful as the ones I showed last week in that special location with the multiple colors. Most of the ones that you'll be seeing around the island are this beautiful light pink and variations on a theme of pink. And then uh, right next to it, over here, we have uh, uh, rose hips. 
So this is definitely the time I started talking last week about how things are starting to go to seed and go to fruit. And uh, there's quite a few rose hips right in this solid area. Um, and these are, of course, great food source for birds. And you've probably heard of rose hip jelly and rose hip tea. And rose hip is uh, the highest natural source of vitamin C. So sometimes you'll see in your vitamin packet uh, with natural vitamin C, it's uh, usually the rose hips that they've extracted that from. So rose hips, if you're hungry along the way, you can chow down on some of those. But the seeds are uh, very fuzzy and a lot of seeds in the middle, so don't, don't bite and swallow too quickly. And also along uh, the edge was a um, mullen. Uh, again, we saw these at this at the beginning of our summer. Uh, this long stalk of yellow flowers and they bloom in a progression going upward. So the last of them are, are blooming. This one is a little out of focus, but you get the idea. And I wanted to show this also over here. Oops, wrong way. Uh, this is a big uh, milkweed plant, common milkweed with the pod already setting. And this um, over there, I'm gonna move my image of the person here. Uh, this is a, um, a common mullen, common mullen uh, stalk that has all, uh, all the flowers have gone and it's now setting seed. So you see that a lot that people think they look like, a, you know, like an old candle or something. All right, moving on. Now we're going to get started. I'm going to actually get rid of my picture. There we go. Um, we are, this is our starting point. It is the last dirt road on Corneck Road going north. On, if you're going north, it's on the right. And um, it looks like, oh, is that somebody's driveway? Well, yes, it is a driveway, but it's also uh, the entry point to this end of the Clayhead Trail, so it'll go along the bluff. Uh, on the corner here, this is a, this is that big lot of U.S. Fish and Wildlife property. Uh, and it's called a National Wildlife Refuge. I think they could update their sign a little bit, but it's not so faded that you can't read it. And they generally put these signs at the corner of their properties. Um, the one that used to be on the road corner doesn't seem to be there or it's covered. Uh, this particular one is at a, another corner down the road. But just so you know, this is all open space and it is quite a good birding spot, especially in the fall. So we're going to uh, just go along this dirt road, and while we're going down the road, we're going to just admire a lot of grasses along the way. Um, this, uh, this, at first I thought this was going to be a rush, but I, I believe it's a grass, and then that's as close as I can get to the identification. But I always say if you stop and look at something closely, all of a sudden you see how beautiful just simple grass head uh, going to seed can be. And that's its natural color, that beautiful pink um, color. So we will, I did key it out and it belongs to a grass that's only found in the Midwest. So obviously I keyed it out wrong. So now, thus it is a grass. <laughs> As we go, lots of, along this wall is a wonderful long stretch of stone wall covered in these lichens. And we're starting to see the hint of fall here with this um, the Virginia creeper starting to turn red. Um, and of course, the old blackberry theme is still with us. Quite a few red ones there, but the, they are definitely producing strongly. And uh, we may even be in our last week for a good hearty blackberry picking. So if you haven't gotten out there, this might be the last week to do it. But beautiful stretch of wall. And you keep going and uh, about three quarters of the way up the road before we get to where we can uh, see the bluff, there's a gate, which is a gate into the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's locked. You can't drive in there. Um, but it's, there are a couple of paths in there. And it, again, uh, because of the low vegetation and the, its position on the north end of the island, it's a really great spot for fall migrants. Uh, the vegetation is, you know, fairly shrubby, so it's fairly low, uh, and you're pretty much in a narrow part of the island, so there's not a lot of land, so the birds tend to be concentrated in, in one spot. So 
um, that is uh, a good place to check out the birds soon or starting soon. Now we're gonna keep going up the road and uh, there's a little house up here which you're not going to go to. It's called Golden Grove. Um, it's not occupied, but it is not abandoned either. And when you get up to the corner where you could go to the left through that gate to Golden Grove, you're not, you're gonna keep going to the right. Um, you can't tell from this picture, but the uh, edge of the bluff is probably about 100 feet uh, straight forward. So if you don't wanna go forward, you wanna go right. And you're gonna be hearing go right a lot during this talk. Um, and you follow the road. So we've gone up the road, we made the turn, and now we're going down this way. And we're gonna get to this spot which is an intersection of uh, two dirt roads. And these roads are the widest I've ever seen them in my life because there's a new house being built in here. So they've had to widen the road and put in a lot of fill and you feel like you're almost, well, not exactly like you're on a highway, but a Black Island dirt road highway, I think. <laughs> but anyway, in this case, we're going to follow the sign that says walkers to the left and the driveway to the right and believe me if you go right you'll hear about it there we go walkers and there's the sign and so again we're going to follow the road and there's another sign right up here that will is this spot and finally we can leave the dirt road and go on to the actual path that's going to go along the bluff for quite a while um, and as well as you go along the path along right along the edge right here you go up a, a slow long hill not too bad and you stop at the top and you turn around and you look north and this is the view looking north coming up uh, the hill and uh, you probably leaving about to leave the last of your great open vistas of the uh, of the ocean and the bluffs now if you go this way so straight turn around stop looking backwards and go forwards uh, you will be looking into this entry, which is the actual entry into the Clayhead Trail system proper. Uh, but before we go through this little entryway that's between the stone walls, we're going to go off to the left. And there's just this little spur and goes right up to the edge of the bluff there where you can, don't get too close, uh, but look down and take a look at the water. and. Um, the water is a little cloudy, but I think by all standards, in the summer it gets a little bit cloudier, but I'm remember I'm at about 100 feet above looking down and you can see the rocks and the seaweed under the water, so clean enough. So that was your little like last looking off spot and then we'll come back and we'll, at this point, We've gone through that little open stone wall and we're heading along the path. And for the first bit, the trail definitely weaves in and out along the bluff edge and then maybe back through some trees and then all of a sudden you're popping out back at the bluff edge. But along the way, you see some things. If you look down, I uh, got this great picture of uh, herring gulls, great black back gulls, and double crested cormorant. And um, if you've ever been on a walk with me, you know that you should never call it a seagull. There is no such thing as a seagull. They're all gulls of some sort. If you don't know what kind of gull, it's just a gull. But the black, great black back gulls are the bigger ones with the black back, like these three. This is a little bit hard to see. This is a herring gull. It's got a more gray back. I think there's another one. Yeah, here's another one over here, gray back. So that's the main difference between our two most freak, uh, most abundant gulls on the island, the great black back and a herring gull. And they were putting up quite a ruckus because I guess they didn't really, weren't too sure about this double crested cormorant just hanging out in here. Um, you can tell it's a double crested. I'm not sure I'll get any closer, but it's got this wonderful sort of yellow orange patch. Um, the great cormorants, which we mostly see in the winter, have a little white edging to that patch. Luckily, um, when you have a camera and you can stop and look for with binoculars, um, anything that's slow enough, you can usually focus in on and 
tell whether or not it is a uh, double crested cormorant or a great cormorant. Um, one thing I noticed when I was looking at this picture is how big its feet are for its size. It looks like it has really big feet. I'm not sure I can get this any bigger. No. Uh, anyway, uh, these uh, cormorants are generally known as um, great divers. Sometimes they're not called hell divers. They can dive up to uh, 30 or 40 feet below the surface um, looking for fish. And their position, their feet are positioned well back in their body. So now it looks like it's in an upright position, but with its legs so far back, those feet become great for diving. And they're, um, and they're so big and wide, those paddles can really send that cormorant <clears throat> deep. And of course, there's the cormorant on the right in its classic stance. Every time a wave came in and was uh, gonna touch its feet, it opened up its wings like that. All right, we move on to the path. One of the things we saw uh, earlier in the summer, uh, yarrow, which is uh, this plant, only it was all white. The, this particular flower head has gone to seed and is passed. One thing you can still see though are these leaves, these very frilly leaves. So even though it's not all white, um, the frilly leaves confirm that it is yarrow. Um, and one of the things I always say in art and nature is make sure you date your work because you might, if you didn't date it, you'd say, well, this plant has brown tufts. Well, no, this plant is white in the spring, in the summer, and brown tufted in the late summer. Other things along the way I happened to see was a black swallowtail. Now, I, black swallowtails have quite a variation in their color pattern. And the more I looked at this one, the more I questioned myself. I'm pretty sure it's a black swallowtail. Uh, if anybody wants to let me know later, that would be fine. It could have been a spice bush swallowtail, but it's kind of old and ratty. Uh, you'll notice right here, this big chunk out of its wing, and it's very frayed along all of its edges. And even in this picture here, which I, blew up maybe a little too much there we go that that section that's out of the wing and the other here it is right here you can just make it out so and you can get a sense of how much frayed so some of its markings may have been already frayed off um of course i you know just love the butterflies um and as i said before the the antenna of butterflies have a little knob whereas moths they're frilly so, but that yellow and, uh, sorry, orange and blue pattern and the black and white body. And I was, there butterflies and uh, are difficult to photograph because darn things move too much. So again, we <clears throat> go along the bluff a little bit more, <clears throat> take another look over the edge of your classic view. This is a very sandy uh, view. Looks very, water looks very inviting down there. Um, but we're going to uh, dip back away from the bluff and start heading inland a little bit more. <clears throat> and eventually you'll come to our first choice of left or right. And for this walk, we're going to go almost exclusively right every time you have a choice. So that would be the thing to remember if you go into this uh, set of walks from this point. Um, if you want to recreate this walk, Every time you have to choose, go right, with two exceptions, which I'll show you as we go along. Uh, for the first two rights, um, there are trail markers. Traditionally, the blue marker is the marker that goes along the bluff, and the red are more inland. So this, this actually helps you out. But go right, and you will come very soon to another intersection. The trail you're coming out of from that last spot comes out this way, even though I took the picture from this direction. Uh, so you'll come out this way. There is another uh, trail marker here. Unfortunately, it's so faded you can't read it, but stick with me and go right. Am I saying? Yeah, right. Uh, and if you do, you'll start, we're starting to head inland and go into a more wooded area. This is probably one of the more woody parts of the Clayhead Trail system. There used to be a lot of big black, uh, black pines here, 
Not so many anymore, but the vegetation has gotten quite wooded. Again, along the way, you see lots of interesting things. Um, the Asiatic bittersweet that we uh, is starting to really bear fruit. Each one of these little green berries is eventually another month will start to, the leaves will turn yellow and the fruit will start popping open that uh, traditional red, uh, red and orange or yellow and orange uh, popped open berry, which seems to be like the icon for fall vegetation. Um, of course, it is a native, uh, not a native, an invasive species, and it's dripping off of almost every tree there is in, in the clay head trail system. So uh, beautiful, yes, at a certain point, but uh, kind of damaging to a lot of the trees because eventually it will completely shade out the tree. Uh, what uh, deer tongue grass is very prevalent throughout this walk. This is another grass, although it doesn't necessarily look like a traditional grass shape as these uh, side leaves. And probably in another week or so, we'll start to see the spike, the seed head spike that will come out this way. But throughout this area, it's a very coarse uh, deer tongue grass. Oops, backwards. And then um, a meadowhawk dragonfly, uh, very distinctive with its red color. Um, when it, dragonflies always have their wings, at, when they're at rest, their wings are out perpendicular to their body. In the case of the meadowhawks, they're also slightly forward as if they were like doing a slow stop. Um, but uh, they are still a dragonfly. A damselfly would have its wings uh, parallel with his body. So there are many uh, variety species of uh, meadowhawks and I checked with somebody who's very good at butter of dragonflies on the island, Nigel Grinley, and he says it's almost impossible to tell the difference unless you're a real specialist and you have um, some other equipment uh, to look at things like how many, what its mouth parts look like, things like that. So as always, I say, just enjoy the view and don't worry so much about the name. Uh, you can put it to the general area of meadowhawk dragonflies. And you keep going along and eventually you'll come to a four-way intersection. And uh, this is a four-way intersection like we have at our police station. It's sort of off center, but you still have the choice of going more or less straight, left or right. We go right. And uh, right, at, if you go right, you'll see this little gap way. Uh, it's a little bit more distinctive than some of the past because there's a, a, a section of the stone wall that's been taken out. So you're stepping over a, an ingrown stone and there's stone walls on either side. So you go right, go through there, and you'll come to a point where you really have to choose left or right. And in this case, you're going to go left. Now, uh, if you were doing this, you would try to remember before you went out that it's after you go through that stonewall gapway, after the four way. When you come here, you go left. If you went right, it's okay. You will end up right where we're going to end up. It's just we're taking a little uh, diverting route to uh, enjoy uh, some other sites. So go left and you'll go into the milkweed field. Um, this path goes right through a very small field, but on either side of the path, it's just filled with milkweed. Uh, and uh, quite beautiful, as you can imagine. Lots of butterflies around. Um, I did not find a caterpillar on this particular walk, but I'm sure if I had looked harder and longer, I would have. Um, nice view of a nice set of um, milkweed pods. Um, these are still ripening, not ready quite to burst open, but there are a few that are bursting open, uh, such as this one over here, and getting starting to, uh, once they dry out and crack their, the, along the edge of the pod, these wonderful seeds with their downy parachutes, um, are ready to be dispersed to the wind. Um, now, I noticed on a lot of them, including this one over here, which you're not seeing so much, there's a lot of these little red things. Now, I hope you're not saying yuck 
because they're pretty cool. This is a large milkweed bug, a true bug. And these are the nymphs. So the uh, milkweed bug will lay eggs and the eggs will hatch into the nymphs, which will grow into a full adult uh, large milkweed bug. Um, and just to take a little bit closer look at what these little gems look like. Aren't they cute? <laughs> they sort of look like little pomegranate seeds, but I don't suggest eating them. Um, so there they are, the nymphs. And then just to give a different, a uh, uh, little bit of more of a, a view of these wonderful milkweed seeds. You can see a whole bunch here about to fall out or come out of the drying out pod. And here's a seed, and here's a seed, and here's a seed, and here's a seed. And they start to be dispersed throughout the island. So I don't think the milkweed bug is hurting these too much. And uh, lots of things will eat the milkweed bug and its nymphs. Um, in the same field, more deer grass, but also um, this type of butterfly. These are called skippers. And uh, skippers, there's, um, they're moths with their feathery antenna. They're butterflies with their knobbed antenna. And skippers, their antenna have like a little hook at the, uh, on their antenna. Uh, but what's interesting about these is their placement of their forewing. So in butterflies, the, the forewing, the, the front wing, and the back wing, the hind wing, are in the same plane run in front of the other. And skippers, they're at an angle, sort of between the body and the hind wing. And we'll get another look. This is two different types, I believe, of skippers. Um, they're very small. Um, and, but you, once you start looking, you realize, oh, that wasn't a little butterfly I saw. It was a skipper. And, um, there's quite a few of them on this. Here's the, uh, the bull thistle and a skipper feeding. And here's a good close up of the skipper. Again, it's hard to get the perspective, but again, this is the forewing that's coming out at an angle between the hind wing and the body. And you notice the, the instead of knobbed, it's sort of like a little cupped, hooked hand. It's not exactly a knob, it's a, it's a hook. So they have big eyes and I, uh, I was having trouble figuring out how to pronounce this. <laughs> fear, fiery, fear, it's not fiery. Anyway, somebody will help me with that at the end of the uh, program. But this is a beautiful little orange skipper. Um, again, many varieties, just like the butterflies of which there were some of them as well. Uh, again, on the bull thistle, thistle was uh, prevalent and uh, there were probably as many uh, monarchs on the thistle as were on the, uh, on the uh, milkweed. And this is the same butterfly, one with its wings closed up and it's a little bit more uh, subdued in colors underneath and then one with its wings opened up on the same uh, thistle, but of course you can only see a few of the leaves, uh, petals of the thistle. Uh, last week we had a monarch butterfly that was a male because it had a, like a little pouch on its vein, whereas the veins of the uh, females are much thicker and more uniform in, uh, in shape. They don't have that little pouch, they're just very thick veins. Um, I noticed, let's see if I can do this. So they also feed, what they're doing is feeding. And right here, this black little thing is its tongue, or sometimes they call it the proboscis. It is uh, sticking it, curling it out into the, um, into the, pe into the uh, flower petals to get nectar. And um, it's quite amazing. I think there's a bee over here that I haven't quite captured. And um, again, over here, you can actually really see the texture of these veins. Um, quite a beautiful, and its little tongue is going out right there. A little hard to see, but you can see its little knobbed antennae. 
So monarch butterflies, who can't look at those forever? I'll move on. And so we're going to go uh, to follow that path and I'll take you to a choice, another choice, left or right. It is right. We only had one left so far. Always go right. And you can know you're on the right because as you look down the path, you've turned right and you're looking down and you see these large maples. We're going to a little grove of large maples. This is a big swamp maple. There's about three or four of them in here and they're big. They're very big. Uh, that's the, that trunk, um, the swamp maples tend to have multiple trunks um, and it's, I could not get, I couldn't stand far enough away to get this tree in the folk in the in one view. So it's quite an amazing tree. I think it might be the largest swamp maple that I know of on Black Island. I'm sure there's a bigger one somewhere, but this is the one I know of. Um, so beautiful, um, shady, always shady in this spot. And the grass is very thin because there's it's so shady. There's this is only one of uh of a couple of swamp maples and also a couple of oaks in this little grove. Now we're gonna we are gonna leave the path which is behind us in this view and we're gonna sort of walk around the trees and we're gonna go out of the path that way. And when we go out far enough and turn around and look back, oops, uh, you'll see this is the maple um, and it's finally got big enough to get part of it or most of it in in the view and we're leaving that shady spot and we're more open path and i looked down and lo and behold there was a little deptford pink um there which is a very small um uh, little wildflower that saw quite a bit earlier in the season they're thinning out uh you can actually tell from this that there were several other blossoms that have already given off and it's not the best uh, uh, view, but um, these are what would be left of is its seed pods where the seeds would be, the flowers would have come off. So Deptford pink. Now, if you keep going along this path, you'll come to where you have to make another de decision. Should I go left or should I go right? And uh, this path is going along the um, a pond called the Bittern Pond. Now, if I went right here, I would come onto this, this path continues on. And at the previous spot where I chose to go left, if I had gone right, I would end up on this path. So, um, so as I said, you'll come back to the same spot. Um, so here we make a decision, do I go? right in which case i would be coming out this way and going around that way or do i go left in which case i come out this way and go that way and so today in this spot only the second time we will go left and we will come to the edge of i use it this time of year as was true last week it's very hard to see into these ponds because there's so much growth and vegetation, but along this particular edge is a little cattail marsh. There's also some white flowers in here, which we'll see a little bit later. Um, I couldn't really get out to them to see, uh, to get a good photo, but we do have plenty of uh, cattails here, um, here in this, uh, swampy area and again some more of those white flowers. So we are going to continue down the path and when we get to the end you have to go left or right. Of course you go right and this path we're basically coming around the end of Bittern Pond and then we're going to go back around that way and we'll come across ah, along the way. Brace yourself. Nature red in tooth and claw. So Nature is not always pretty. Sometimes you find things you're not expecting. And uh, this is very hard to identify a bird when it doesn't have its head. Um, at first I thought, eh, what is that? Maybe a cat bird? 
but um, I looked at it a little more closely. I noticed that it has very long legs and toes. Um, its tail feathers have white in the outer tail feathers uh, and its undertail covers, which in a cat bird, even if young, would be more rusty colored. So I'm pretty sure this is a towhee, a young towhee. Um, still mostly downy, you can tell by these feathers. These are downy-like feathers. It, this is a very young, was a very young bird. Um, so as I like to say, the hawks have to eat too. In this case, I would be guessing that this was a cat. Cats are notorious for taking the head and leaving everything else. So enough gruesomeness, we'll move on to, ah, yes, along this edge of the pond, it, more ferns. And um, these, this was a rather small fern. And I, again, I'm, ferns are a difficult group that I'm just starting to appreciate and not really learn their names yet. But when I turn it over, I see this very distinctive spore pattern underneath. Um, and uh, last week we looked at a different fern and it had a completely different spore pattern. So that, this is the thing that helps us identify um, various ferns by not only the shape of the fern, the size, whether or not these little are smooth or multi-lobed. Um, these are a little bit more toothed than these last week. This was a very large fern. This is a very small fern. But look how different the spore uh, uh, packets are in these two species. So, and I really loved looking at these, this, this smaller one from this week. I guess I won't get it bigger. You can actually see that it's like a little cup that's it's got real depth to it. And I get, I'm thinking that the spores are developing in those and then will be released into the air. Um, I'm gonna have to spend a good part of my winter learning about ferns and their life cycles. But just in these two that I picked up, one this week, one last week, uh, completely different spore patterns um, and fascinating and amazingly interesting for something so tiny and unnoticed most of the time. So. There's always something to see. Let's see, I'll move out from my new friends, the, fer the ferns. And of course, along the way, there are lots of, on this particular uh, walk from the beginning, we saw grasses, sedges, and rushes, another group of plants that are very difficult to identify. Uh, sedges generally have a stem that is uh, edged in, um, in cross-section would be a triangle. Rushes are circular in cross-section. Um, this I'm pretty sure is a wool grass, it's a sedge. It's very hard to get a photo of this because it's the background, but at the top of the stem, it comes out in these branches. And on each one of these branches are this sort of hanging heads of, um, this is the flower of the sedge. Uh, this was definitely um, a, a triangular stem. And this is, I'm pretty sure I have the identification of wool grass correct on this one. This rush, I have no idea what this is, but one of the distinctive characteristics of a, a rush is that they're round cylindrical stems, usually singular, and the flower heads usually come out of the side of the stem, which this clearly does. And then this one over here is another sedge. Um, for a while, I thought it might be twig sedge, uh, but then I lost confidence and I just went with sedge. So these are the sedges as, as our unknown gulls are gulls, unknown sedges are sedges. And we're one little spot where we could see into the bittern pond. It's very, this is a pond that is really full of vegetation on all sides. Um, very muddy. Uh, there's not a lot of water flow into it. 
um, but it must be perched fairly high because it's been a dry summer and there's still quite a bit of water in it, even though it's obviously a very still pond and it is covered over with green algae, um, which you can see a little bit here, this sort of green all through it. Now that is uh, an algae bloom. It's part of the natural uh, state of things. Uh, there's more nutrients in there because of all the vegetation, not a lot of uh, oxygen because the uh, water is not flowing and stirring. Um, and this is the natural sort of evolution of a pond will eventually eutrophy and start filling in and uh, become a, a swamp and then a maybe a marsh and then a bog and then a fen and then before you know it it's a meadow but for now it's beautiful uh, bittern pond and this is a great place to go bird watching uh, in well just about all times of year but again in the fall migration coming up birds who are migrating want to be uh, near water so they can uh, rehydrate and there's always lots of cover and food and um, there's a path that goes almost all the way around this pond so as the leaves start to drop off you'll start to be able to look into things and in fact it is known to have had bittern in the past and it's the only place I've ever known that a least bittern was seen uh, in recent years on Black Island was in this and this is perfect bittern territory, slow moving, thick water with lots of things to hide and skulk around, which is typical bittern and rail. This would be great rail habitat as well. So there we go. And as you keep going, you will start to come out and see civilization, so to speak, a house. Well, actually, this is a little tiny cottage. It's known as the Bay Rose Mansion. Um, it uh, belongs to the Nature Conservancy now. At one point, it belonged to the Lapham family. And uh, it is twice the size that it was uh, before, when it was given to the Nature Conservancy. It, it was added onto, uh, and it's a re become a research uh, station for field, uh, field researchers. In, the, in past years, not this year, um, the, the group from Columbia University was studying ticks and uh, tick-borne diseases spent its summers in this little bungalow and it's a bungalow no frills and uh, for many 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 years now the university of rhode island has had ornithologists staying there in spring and fall doing bird banding again uh they will not be here this year i do not believe um but it will be there will be bird banding going on in this area uh so when you i don't recommend going that around uh, this path in the in the fall because you're probably running into some bird nets um, and probably not too welcomed by the ornithologists. But in the off season, the off banding season, uh, this is a great walk, especially in winter time because it's fairly well protected. Now, if you go up the path and past the little Bay Rose mansion, so to speak, uh, you'll go into their little driveway and you'll come out over here and you could, oops, you could take a, if you took a right here, you would take yourself back into the May, into the Clayhead Trails. Um, again, if you had taken, when I, the first time you had to choose left, if you'd gone right, you would have come to the spot that I indicated earlier and where we took a left, but if you had taken a right, you would have come out here. So, if you were nervous at all, once you come into the Clayhead Trail systems from the uh, bluff from the north end, if you just keep taking a right, you will end up in this spot right here, in which case you can go straight down the road that leads to Corn Neck Road. Uh, the hill, the last hill on Corn Neck Road is called Bushlot Hill. And that's where this road will take you. And when you come out, this is what it'll look like looking back into the road. So I always like to give people sort of a, a field mark, a landmark. And uh, I think this pretty big stump 
And this large rock right next to this road is a good field mark for how you get into the Bay Rose Mansion part of the Clayhead Trails. Uh, and just on the other side of Corn Neck Road here, just on the other side is the um, step style for the labyrinth. So you can uh, just sort of get your landmarks down to know where you are and how you gain access. From this point, we will proceed down the road and um, we're back to our, we started with 15 of all the flowers along the edge between the road and uh, Corneck Road and Sockham Pond. And as I said, I had better botanizing in terms of flowers, uh, uh, wildflowers along uh, Corneck Road. Uh, sun drops, they're in the primrose family. Um, they're quite beautiful. Uh, there's an evening primrose, um, which only blooms <laughs> in the evening, um, whereas the sun drop is open, wide open during the day and closes up in the evening. So it's, uh, they're very similar. There's a few other distinctive uh, characteristics, but this is definitely a sun drop. And I think it's one of the best names of a flower. I, I know of, I just, it looks like little drops of sun. There's also a vine that's just starting to um, have its flowers. It's called ground nut. It is a vine that's going all throughout uh, the area between the guardrail and the pond. Um, it's in the legume or the bean family. Um, and you can see it's to my eye, a very beautiful, uh, flowering vine. That color, I'm not sure what color that is, it's some kind of mauve or pink. It's frilly form of the open flower like a pea. Uh, it's just, it's just beautiful. And how did, I don't know, how, how did nature come up with something so gorgeous? <laughs> so anyway, I digress. Uh, another plant in this same area is something called Sweet Everlasting, and it's got this sort of branching form, little tiny uh, white flowers. Um, when you look at the end, they have little yellow openings, a little, you know, that's the center of the flower. This, those flowers do not open up. Um, sometimes uh, there are flowers in this group that are known as uh, pussy toes, or yeah, pussy toes or uh, paws, um, but this is the sweet everlasting. The pearly everlasting, which is very similar, um, and I'm pretty sure this is not pearly everlasting, but I can easily be corrected, but usually pearly everlasting is a, the leaves are a lot downier. They have more of a white woolly down on them. Uh, so I'm pretty sure this is the sweet everlasting. And throughout that whole area is the wild grape. It's just sort of a this big matrix of wild grape with its big leaves and lots of little ground nut in here growing and weaving its way through. Um, there's some goldenrod just, you know, budding but not blooming. Another week, it'll have another whole nother dimension of color and, and shape. But in there, which I'm not seeing in this particular view, there's also quite a bit of this, which is a spotted touch-me-not or jewel weed. Um, beautiful. There's a there's another. It's, there's spotted touch-me-not and I forget the other one. But this one is orange. The other one is yellow. This one is heavily spotted. That's the name. And this one, the back of its hood curls underneath, whereas the other one, the the, uh, the back of its, uh, of its cone is more straight up. So this is spotted touch me not. Um, the reason it, it is, uh, or jewel weed, it's a very succulent plant. It's got a lot of moisture in it and it only grows where it's very moist, where its feet can get into the to wet, moist land. Um, but if you break it open, it's very moist. You can uh, rub your hands and it's known to be, uh, something to help counteract poison ivy. Um, so it's uh, very moist and I don't think I would trust it for a poison ivy uh, cure-all, but for a quick something in the field before you get home to really scrub off the oils of poison ivy, touch me not or jewel weed is a good 
place to start. Also along uh, this very part of Corneck Road, uh, on the other side of the road, we're great stand of goldenrod that's blooming. Um, it's not, there are a few patches around the island of uh, this particular very tall goldenrod. In fact, I think this is tall goldenrod. Um, the goldenrod has many, many species. Um, they have different forms. This is the form where the head comes up and sort of flops over the, the flowers equally in all directions. Um, so I'm pretty sure. Again, it is a goldenrod, whether it is tall goldenrod or not, almost doesn't matter because it's beautiful. And right, oops, <laughs> preview. Uh, right next to it is a uh, Joe Pieweed, um, another great late summer um, native plant. Um, again, I'm always happy, sort of like the uh, bone set, I'm always happy when I see Joe Pieweed because there seems to be less and less of it on the island. And I could not end the presentation without this week's version of the blackberries. Um, we've gotten to the point where we started with blackberry blossoms earlier in the summer, and now we're baking them in a pie. And this, this photo and pie, although I didn't get it, the photo is courtesy of uh, Lisa Sprague. Uh, there are other great things happening around the island. That was the end of the walk, but just a um, couple of quick things are happening on uh, this week in August. Uh, ladies' tresses, which is an orchid, has been uh, seen. A uh, pretty rare plant to see on the island, although it's widely distributed. I've seen it in all parts of the island, sometimes near moisture, sometimes not. Um, they don't last long. They are a favorite deer food, and I suspect that's why they're dwindling in number. But Heather Hatfield got this great photo of uh, lady tresses in a different part of uh, the Clayhead Trails. And last week, I was able to uh, catch for banding a northern water thrush, which is the first migrant that I've gotten for the fall, upcoming fall migration season. And uh, beautiful secretive bird almost always is the first migrant that I see on Block Island um, in the late summer. Um, things that are coming, also saw some fungus, fungi. Uh, fungi are usually more uh, uh, an organism for the fall. It, once we get a little moisture, it only had to rain a little bit last week for these to pop out of some uh, mulch material. Uh, again, the f I have no idea what kind of uh, mushroom this is, but it looks beautiful. This is the, the first day I saw it. It was domed. I took this picture the second day and it had already started to curl upwards. But again, look at that, that shape, that design. It's, it's gorgeous. And uh, on Corneck Road, and these, this is the plant that I was looking at in the back of the, or in the middle of that uh, cattail swamp. This is water parsnip. Um, it's uh, growing, this is, Corneck Road, but, um, and it has very uh, limited leaves, these beautiful white distinctive heads. So they are just starting to bloom. Some are blooming like this, some are yet to bloom. So we've got another week or two of water parsnips. Again, these like wet feet, so only where it's swampy or, or groundwater is near the surface. Um, I, Sometimes we're lucky enough to get out in the water and see what's out in the waters of Block Island. Uh, this is a skate, the underside of a skate where its face is. Uh, I think it's, it just makes me laugh. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is a clear nose skate based on its shape and the patterning on the back, which you're not seeing in this photo. Um, uh, this 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 fish was returned to the sea. It was we we're just holding it uh, for the photo to get the hook out of its mouth, which was fine, and it went back to swimming. And lest you think that I do not have any fun in the summer, here's a black sea bass, uh, which was caught last week, and this one did not go back into the ocean. And as always, my little mini bird checklist for the day that I did this walk, which was August 21st. And I think one of two notable things on this 
uh, my bird observations that day. One was the northern flicker, which I haven't seen too many of this summer, if any, and the red-breasted nuthatch. And that is also a migrant and a very early um, for this time, early migrant for this time of year. And I heard uh, several yanking away in the, the Clayhead trails, and I've had reports from other places around the island as well. So it's starting slowly, but the migration is here. And with that, I'll. Well, that's it. That's great, Kim. Thank you so much. I loved it. I think I found four globes. <laughs> Did I mute you by accident? Oh, wait, I thought I unmuted all. Wait, yes. Okay, so people can unmute themselves if they choose. Um, any questions or comments? I have a question. This is Josie. Can you go hear ahead? Me? Yep, go ahead, Josie. Well, what was the name of the skate and how big was that? I couldn't get the scale of it. Oh, wait. Sorry, Kim is muted. Hold on. Am I muted? Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm messing up here. I'm okay. trying to unmute. It's okay, oh. now you, did, you got it. Okay. We're good. <laughs> right? You got it, right? I got it. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. This, uh, I'm pretty sure it was a clear-nosed skate, um, and there's clear. many clear, C-L-E-A-R, yeah. yeah, no, N-O-S-E, yeah, yeah. yeah, one word. Um, the shape of it, the front of its body, its size, that skate was about, let's see, I would say the body part was about 18 to 20 inches, uh, and it looked like it was smiling to me. <laughs> Yeah, with little teeth. With little teeth, for and you just see how perfectly adapted it is for going along prone on the sea floor with its mouth on the floor looking for things to eat. It's perfect. Gosh, <laughs> thank you. All right, anybody else? You want to identify where the orbs are? I wasn't looking for <laughs> I'll try by memory. I, I wrote it down. <laughs> okay, go. One was in the, the path to Bittern Pond, where you, yep. where you described right there. Yeah. One was in that first swamp maple, I think it was slide number 10. Uh, the or big in, or number 10, yeah, the yep. swamp maple. Yep. And yeah. then you had a, a like a wall with lichen on it and Virginia creeper. Yep. And then on and the first slide, the um, the introduction. Right. So that's the same picture. Oh, whoops. Okay. Same place. Yep. Oh, I missed one then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other one is very hard to see. It's in the tree that's going to the uh, the spur, the first spur before you enter the uh, Clayhead Trails where you're headed to the, uh, to look over the, at the edge, there's a cherry tree off to the left and it's in there and it's almost impossible to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, They're, they're clear, they're hard to see. <laughs> but that's been yeah. fun, I hope it's fun for you guys. Yeah, great idea. Great Kim, so uh, I guess- Kim. It's, uh, I missed the I missed the very beginning when you're talking about the orbs. Did did you already talk about it being in the New York Times? I believe today. I did not. Why don't you go ahead? I didn't talk about that. Uh, that's about all I know. But <laughs> I haven't read it yet. But there is a New York Times story about the artist whose name I can't remember. It's uh, it's Eben uh, Horton. Yeah. Right. He has a glass playing business over on in South County, Rhode Island. Um, so very yeah. generous today. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't read the article either, but I did see a mention of it. Um, so that's interesting. Okay, so Kim, I think this, next week is our final one. Where are we going next week? So next week, we're gonna take one of my favorite walks. And of course, it's like birds. My favorite bird is the one in my hand and the favorite walk is the one I'm doing at the moment. But my favorite walk uh, <laughs> over the breed land, uh, the town road from 
uh, Corn Neck Road to the ocean and uh, many habitats should be a beautiful late summer walk. And then um, we've gotten reasonable response to these. So since we're still under COVID-19 COVID um, restrictions, I'm going to continue the once a month for a while until we can go back in person. Right. So, so we'll probably do one in uh, around the third week of uh, September and then October, November, December, January, February, March. <laughs> then hopefully we'll see. <laughs> That's great, Kim. I'm, I'm so, excited about that. Yeah. Great. So uh, anything else, Kim, or are we, do we, are we wrapping no, up right now? I think we can wrap up. People can always uh, contact me at kim.gaffet at the tnc.org if you have follow-up questions. And um, thanks for coming along. Great. See ya. Well, thank great. you. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Bye, everybody. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.